Welcome to today's edition of RPE University, Winning Technical Pitches with Dane Boyson and Ilan Gur. This is the fourth and intended series of practical seminars on core concepts and skills to help transition breakthrough technologies into successful commercial products. RPE University was first launched at the 2012 RPE Energy Innovation Summit, and we are pleased to announce that registration is now available for the 2013 RPE Summit, and more information can be found at www rpe-summit.com. If you have ideas for topics for speakers that you'd like to see featured in the, uh, future editions of RPE University, please contact us to suggest those, and we look to craft this series in a way that helps our community uh, by providing research, best practices, and, and lectures. So we look forward to your suggestions. Today's presentation is a 30-minute uh, overview followed by a discussion of Q&A. Since this is a re-recording, we will be using Q&A that was submitted during our live presentation on October 3rd, and we'll be selecting questions for the discussion with Dr. Gore and Dr. Boyson today. And I'll now introduce uh, Dr. Dan Boyson, who currently serves as an RPE program director. His main focuses include electrochemical energy conversion and storage, natural gas conversion and storage technology, and materials for energy storage and conversion. Prior to joining RPE, Dr. Boyson led the development of a grid-scale energy storage liquid metal battery at MIT under Professor Donald Sadaway. And Dr. Ilan Gur, also a program director here at RPE, his technical uh, focus areas include electrical and thermal energy storage, advanced battery management, solar energy, and new materials for energy conversion and storage. He also serves as a senior uh, technical advisor helping RPE's technology to market effort which focuses on preparing breakthrough energy technologies for the transition from lab to market, including programs like today's RPE University. Dr. Gore has spent his career developing and commercializing clean energy technologies based on advances in material science. Prior to RPE, he served as co-founder and director of CEO, a venture-backed lithium backup startup company. Dr. Gore. Thanks so much, Adam. Uh, and thanks everyone who's joining us today. Um, you know, just a quick, sort of overview in terms of how this program came about, uh, you know, the Adam just provided some nice introductions to Dane and myself. You know, the, the only and probably most important thing you need to know is that, you know, we're two of the folks here who, who end up reading all the proposals that come in and, and making decisions on, on what we're going to fund. And basically, you know, we spend a lot of time as a team here at RPE, uh, you know, together talking about our process, talking about things that are going well and not well, and, and after reviewing a bunch of proposals, you know, this was the product of us sitting around, you know, and some of us saying, you know what I really hate when, when I'm looking at proposals? You know, this is really bother, bothers me. You know, this could have potentially been a great, uh, great proposal, but the proposal came in this X, Y, and Z form, and, and that really, you know, sucked. <laughs> and then, you know, Dane might respond and say, oh, but you know what I really love to see? And we sort of have this conversation, and then we said to ourselves, well, why should we keep this to ourselves? You know, if we share this with the community, uh, hopefully that lets everyone do a, a better job of, um, uh, of submitting things that are in line with what we're looking for. So that, that's kind of the motivation is to uh, help you all um, in the process. Uh, there's a slide up here just, um, just to emphasize uh, what you're going to hear today is basically the views of, of Dane and myself. Um, we think they're pretty representative of, you know, what the set of program directors here at RPE, uh, kind of the way we think, the way we perceive uh, proposals, what we're looking for. Um, but definitely, definitely the one thing to keep in mind is, you know, if we have a solicitation out, read the solicitation. Uh, the solicitation describes in detail exactly what, what criteria we're going to use to choose projects, et cetera. And so this should just be considered more of a, a broad general set of, uh, set of thoughts and guidance. Um, so, you know, one of the key points I think we'll make today is, you know, in the, the question of, of what's a winning pitch really depends on who is receiving the pitch. Um, and, you know, generally speaking, honing a message to an audience is important. So we figured before we jump into our thoughts on, on goods and bads and proposals to RPE, we should just give you a quick background on RPE, uh, which I think is relevant. Um, as many folks know, RPE is a, a very new agency. Um, we sit within the Department of Energy, and the very short history of, of RPE, you know, if, if we rewind back, um, most folks know that RPE is modeled after uh, DARPA, 
Um, DARPA was created uh, during the Sputnik days when folks, you know, basically, re you know, were watching a satellite go through the sky and said, you know, hey, that's not our technology. Maybe we're falling behind in some critical technologies for defense. Um, fast forward to 2006 with the rising above the gathering storm report from the National Academies, there was another sense that, you know, here we are, if we look at energy technologies, this is a really critical wave of innovation that's, that's coming globally. It has implications to our uh, environmental security, our economic security, our national security, and we may be falling behind. And so uh, ARPA-E was basically established to be a, a DARPA-like agency for energy. Um, probably the most important thing uh, for you folks on this slide is um, you know, since our, in, our first funding in 2009, we've basically been operating at a run rate of about $200 million a year on average, uh, um, and we're at, at the heart of an R&D funding agency. So that most of that money is going out um, to researchers through open competitive solicitations. Uh, this is probably the most important slide on the background. Um, if there's anything to keep in mind about RPE, it's that we have a very, very clear mission from Congress. It's spelled out in our statute. Uh, our goal is to develop not the incremental technologies, so not things that already exist on today's technology roadmaps, but really over the horizon, high impact, disruptive, we like to use the word game changing technologies, um, but specifically with three goals. Uh, one is to reduce uh, the U.S.'s dependence on foreign energy sources. Uh, one is to improve energy efficiency in the U.S., and the third is to reduce emissions related to energy use. And so these three goals really serve as a hard filter for us uh, when we're looking at things we may want to fund. If it doesn't fit at least one of these mission areas, we generally will not touch it. When we build programs at RPE, there are a number of elements that we're looking for uh, and I think this is reflected in the way we review proposals as well. Um, the first thing that we care about and um, one of the most important things is the question of impact. And we basically ask ourselves in a program, if the set of technologies we could fund in this program succeed, will they make not a small impact but a significant impact and specifically a significant impact on one of our mission areas? And so that's a really key piece. I'd say similarly important is the second point here, which is the question of, is this a transformative technology? Um, and basically there, we're really looking for new ideas. We're looking for different approaches. We're looking for things which, you know, I like to say have some innovative spark in them. Um, and so that we think this is something that has the opportunity to disrupt the way things are done today. Uh, thirdly, um, uh, we're looking for things that create bridges, uh, bridges between science and technology. I think one of the important bridges is, uh, you know, creating bridges to to provide research to areas which were, you know, in, in today are islands and not, you know, not finding support elsewhere in terms of uh, R and D uh, support. And so that's an important one. And then finally, you know, I think this is true. Everyone's looking for a great team. Um, in in our case. Um, uh, we're looking for teams that possess all of the different qualities that you need to address the major technical risks uh, that that you're overcoming in your in your technical project. So, so these are the key areas we're looking for, and I think you'll find us refer back to them uh, over the course of of the next half an hour as we go through this presentation. Um, so that's some background on RPE. Uh, we decided, you know, we were going to basically tell you about five things that we hate to see and five things that we love to see. Um, but we're going to start on, on, the, on the bad side, and then, uh, and then Dane will pick it up and, and hopefully uh, give some more uplifting comments. Um, you know, so this is a, a little cheeky here, but we basically say, you know, thou shall not submit a proposal that is, you know, these things. And, and again, you know, these are the things where, you know, that, that keep us up at night after we've been reviewing proposals that we say, wow, that really frustrated me about X, Y, and Z proposals. So let me just jump into these. Um, uh, so the first, uh, and this relates to that impact, right, criteria that we're looking for, um, the first is a proposal that we just see as insignificant. And a few things could go wrong here. Um, one is you could just basically 
The, the proposal may not do a good enough job showing a connection between success in the project to what the impact would be on the mission areas. So sometimes it's just the way it's written, we don't see a strong connection. Um, but then there are two manifestations of this that, that tend to arise um, that I think are worth pointing out. Uh, so I, I just threw a couple examples here, right? So here's an example of a proposal we might get which talks about a really novel, exciting new membrane technology that's going to make better coffee filters. Uh, and basically, um, this technology is going to improve the efficiency of coffee filtration by 10x, right? Uh, and that's going to impact over 100 million, you know, citizens in the U.S. who drink coffee every day. And so, you know, the, the right, what we find here is this is actually, you know, this is a huge improvement. A 10x improvement uh, is a big deal, and potentially it could be a big deal to any given coffee maker, <laughs> right? Um, but while there's a big improvement here, there's not necessarily a big impact, right? And, you know, what we will do in almost every proposal is say, well, let's add up and see how it affects our mission area. And in this case, okay, this is 10 times more, you know, more efficient coffee makers. So let's look at how many people in the U.S. own a coffee maker. Let's look at how often they're used. Let's look at that electricity savings. Uh, we'll convert it back into primary energy savings. And we generally want to see a significant impact, which to us means, you know, we need to be on the order of quads, right? We need to be in percentages or multiple percentages of total U.S. primary energy consumption, production, emissions. Um, and uh, here, obviously, we're not going to get to that, to that scale. So, so this wouldn't pass the significant impact test. Um, a, a, a different type of example I have here is, um, so this is an interesting one. Okay, so now we've got a new hydrogel technology that allows you to create a super diaper, which you use the diaper, you flash it very quickly with UV light, and all of a sudden, you know, it's kind of fully degradable. It can dissolve in water in 30 seconds versus a typical diaper, which would be, you know, many, many years. Um, and in this case, the impact is obviously really, really big, right? This could save, you know, 18 billion diapers for entering U.S. landfills each year. And so, you know, this is the type of proposal that comes into RPE where any individual program director might say, you know, I would love to fund this. This is a very high impact project. And then we think about it and we say, the unfortunate thing here is that it has a big impact, but it's not a big impact on one of our mission areas, right? So RPE does not have the mission of saving, you know, municipal waste. Uh, and, and, and this isn't related to energy efficiency, foreign energy sources, emissions, uh, or at least not in a big enough way. And so, you know, this is kind of a, you know, a fail uh, in terms of trying to seek funding from RPE. So um, insignificant is, is the first one. Uh, second is indistinguishable. And basically, you know, this kind of goes to that novelty piece. Um, you might give us a proposal which actually has, you know, technically sound, could have a very big impact, but we may know that in your field of work there are 30 other projects or 30 other teams around the country that are working on something very similar. Um, and so then the question is, well, what, why should we be funding this specific proposal? And if there are 30 other groups doing similar work directionally, you haven't really told us enough of what you're doing different such that you couldn't, you know, why aren't you being funded by the same folks who are funding all the other folks around the world that are doing this work? Um, and so you really want to, to think about differentiation and say, you know, Here's exactly what makes us different, not just from the way things are being done today, but also from other competing kind of emerging technology approaches uh, around, around the world. Um, so the third here is, is incremental. Uh, and, you know, the picture here is, is sort of, uh, you know, just meant to be a metaphor, right? Uh, there are a lot of base hits that can be important. Um, but RPE as an agency is not set up to fund base hits we're set up to fund projects which are looking for home runs. And so oftentimes we will get proposals in that, you know, could potentially have a good impact, um, could even be novel and creative, um, but we basically say, you know what, the, what they're actually asking us to fund, we feel pretty confident that they'll be able to do it. And, you know, if there's a high degree of confidence that the technical proposal, the technical program will succeed, there are probably, that, that implies there are probably a number of sources of funding available for a low-risk project, right? 
And so we want to put RPE money into things where there aren't other sources of funding available, largely because you know no one no one's willing to consider funding this proposal because it's sort of so out there, so high risk, so you know really sort of swinging for the fences. Um, and so, but something to keep in mind is if it seems like this is a low risk, it seems like you're you're definitely going to succeed in the technical approach. That that might not go over well uh, when when we're looking at the proposal. Um, Next one is incoherent. Uh, we get a lot of proposals from top researchers and top practitioners around the country, um, and that's great. Occasionally, we run into this situation where we actually have a team with several, you know, all-stars, superstars, you know, best in their field. Um, but then we start, and we, you know, that's exciting. And then we start reading the proposal, and basically, we see that it almost looks like these three or four individuals who are each amazing in their fields, each wrote a section of the proposal um, based on their knowledge base, and then someone stapled it all together and submitted it. Uh, and so the analogy here is, you know, if you look at this picture of, of the jazz band, you know, these all might be world-class jazz players, and yet if they're not coordinated and they don't have an aligned vision and they haven't practiced together, I mean, everyone looks kind of confused in this picture, right? The outcome could end up being pretty sloppy. Uh, and we feel the same way about proposals. If we don't feel like there's a cohesive vision around a project and a leader that's driving that vision among a, among a team that's working together, that worries us quite a bit. And that can be something that, that kind of kills a, kills a proposal. Um, and then the, the fifth here uh, is a, a particularly frustrating situation. Uh, I put here, you know, it should not be indefinite. Which basically, you know, we oftentimes get proposals that have all of the right claims, you know, very high impact, seems innovative, et cetera. And yet, once we start reading, we realize there's actually no detail on the technology being proposed. And so, I put an example here of sort of a, 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 good, a good way and a bad way to do this. Uh, and starting with the bad, right, so this is, you know, you'll recognize this picture from, from Back to the Future. This is the DeLorean time machine. And, you know, we might get a proposal that says, okay, here's a next generation vehicle allows for, you know, very energy efficient time travel, 10 times more efficient time travel to any date, time, place in the history of the universe. Wow, that's huge. Big, big impact. And then, you know, they might say the technology leverage is novel proprietary technology from Doc and the Fly Industries, Inc. Say, so, okay, interesting. Um, and it's been validated at proof of concept scale by these industry advisors who include several Nobel laureates, and they're all fantastic, right? And, and that's great, but you haven't actually told us what we're talking about, and, and uh, we can't make a decision to fund something without any information. And so sort of on the flip side here, you know, we would rather have this look like, you know, you'll notice the first bullet point here is the same major claim, right, which is great. Um, but then, with the, you know, the proposal would say, okay, this is a next generation flux capacitor based on X, Y, and Z alloy. Um, you'll notice they don't have to give us any composition details. They're just telling us, you know, something about the technology. And, you know, here's some, un, here's some reason, some rationale as to why the technology uh, can give us the effect that we're claiming. Um, and ideally, you have got some references there. And then, you know, time tower requires 1.21 gigawatts uh, of power. Um, and, you know, we've actually done a full mass and energy balance outlined in the table, right? So we want to see supporting evidence. We want to see it through references. We want to see it through data. Um, if you're worried about proprietariness, if you're worried about um, giving up, you know, we don't want you folks to be giving up trade secrets, et cetera, you need to give some amount of detail in your proposal. And so, I, you know, I'd say that's a bit of a cost of doing business. Um, but you'll notice in this case, you know, you can give a lot of supporting evidence without, you know, going into, for instance, the composition, the specific composition. You know, you can provide data um, and, you know, sometimes you might leave out some of the pieces of the axes, but call out specifically. If you're leaving out information or you're not telling us something because you're worried about it being proprietary, call that out so we understand why uh, we're not getting the full information and, uh, and we can find ways to deal with that. Um, but otherwise, if you just don't tell us anything, uh, it's very hard for us to justify fund, you know, funding the, the proposal. Um, so, you know, this is just, you know, in review, the, the five pieces of, of the deadly sins we described. Uh, the one thing I'd say is we occasionally 
get proposals where it seems pretty clear that the folks who are, propo who are proposing uh, looked at all of the things that RPE wants to see in a proposal um, and basically sort of tailored the proposals to sound like you know they've really hit it out of the park on every access that we're looking for. And so the one thing to keep in mind is you know, this is generally, these are the things we're looking for. Uh, you know, for instance, if you think of impact and novelty, oftentimes, you know, those two things are a bit at odds, right? We might have a very, very, a proposal that could be very high impact potentially, but not so novel or less novel, or a proposal that is a bit less high impact, but the novelty is so interesting that we say, you know, we really need to fund this. It's going to change the way people think about this entire field. Uh, what we don't like to see is proposals that basically sort of try and work it so that everything looks in incredible. And so what I'd say is um, the, the sort of last deadly sin is, you know, be sincere. Uh, don't be insincere in the proposal. We'd rather have you tell us really what the strengths are and what the potential weaknesses are. Um, and, and we'll respect that generally um, versus, you know, w we will notice if, if a proposal just seems kind of part of the proposal really seems kind of out there um, and, and really sort of revved up uh, to match what we're looking for, uh, it, it tends to not go over very well. So that's uh, that's my piece, and um, I'm going to hand it over to Dane to talk about uh, some of the things we'd love to see in proposals. Um, and I think he's going to start by going through um, just a little bit of a description on on what the review process looks like at RPE uh, to kind of help help guide that conversation. Thank you, uh, Elon. I appreciate that. Uh, Elon uh, definitely hit home, uh, I think, uh, my sentiments on things that uh, we don't like to see uh, when we're reading proposals. And hopefully now I can give you a little bit of background on things we like to see. Um, first, I think it, it's probably useful to, to go over what uh, the process is at RPE in terms of reviewing proposals to give you some perspective. Um, we, we move very quickly. Uh, the first thing to realize it, the way RPE works is that um, it's a, what we call a program director driven agency. Uh, both Elon and I uh, come from other places. We're short term and, and every program director at RPE has a term limit of about three years, which means that we have very little time to uh, start a program, get it up, review it, and and then get it underway. And the way it works is that uh, once we uh, start at RPE, we immediately begin uh, doing a deep technical dive and trying to identify white space. Uh, we hold a, a workshop or two to flush it out and then um, develop a program. And then internally, we uh, pitch the program to the other program directors and the director of RPE. And if it's well received, then we will launch a FOA. That entire process is somewhere between two and four months. And once the FOA is released, um, then typically we uh, uh, receive concept or request concept papers as a first stage, a couple of pages, a review of your your idea, and then that <clears throat> those concept papers are reviewed uh, by external reviewers, typically. It, uh, three external reviewers. Um, we are not a, a rack and stack organization. We don't. We are not required to use uh, what the reviewers are, or take the reviewers' comments um, and select only those with high reviews. We have the ability as program directors to use the reviewers' um, input as as advice, but can select uh, programs or projects that did not score well um, in the review pro in the re from the reviewers. Uh, once we make sort of preliminary selections, uh, both at the concept paper and the uh, full paper phase, uh, we have to we have what we call an, a merit review board, which is an internal process in which uh, we go through every single program that we would like to select. Uh, or every single project we would like to select for a program, and uh, then have to defend that in front of the other people on the review board. So there, there is a lot of internal checks, um, and by the time we actually make our selections uh, of full proposals, 
we usually know the projects pretty well because we actually have to defend projects internally. So uh, if, if you've gotten a project funded, congratulations, it means that a program director championed your project within RPE. So that's, I think, important to realize when you're applying to RPE is that, that projects are picked up by the program directors. So that's sort of the first, first point. Now, uh, sort of just getting into um, what we like to see. I, I, uh, this is just a, an example of an interesting paper that I took as a, a model. It's not, it's not illustrative of a technology that we particularly like to see, but uh, about more about how to write um, your sort of, I would say, particularly concept paper phase, uh, so as to to, to um, have the best chance of being selected for full application. And there, there, you know, there are a number of things uh, that uh, I think you can do that could really help you make that leap. Um, you should understand that in so in many cases we read hundreds of concept papers. Um, in in the full or in the open FOAT, the first open FOAT, there were four thousand, almost four thousand applications, which means that there were twelve thousand reviews. So it's a it's a mind numbingly large number of, of reviews to be done and at some point uh you know the program directors read through all those ones that they end up picking up. So uh we read a lot of these things and uh so my this is as I said just a prototype example with a, a formula for you to help you um pitch your technology uh to RPE. So the first point, uh, first thing that we like seeing is um, describe the technology innovation in the first sentence. Um, get to the point fast. We read a lot of these things, and we're all at RPE as program directors very technically capable. We usually understand the problem um, pretty pretty well, um, and what we like to see and what we're really looking for is, at least in the concept paper, is the technology uh, what's the technology? What's new and innovative about your idea? And that should be right up front. So here, in this case uh, of the fluorine ion battery, we put it right up at front. We propose, we propose, we propose a rechargeable fluorine ion battery that uses solid-state fluorine ion conductor with metal fluorine uh, electrodes. So now I know right away what exactly the jet, jet, the idea of the proposal is going to be around. The second thing we like to see, um, and is incredibly useful in reviewing uh, uh, applications, is, is is visual aid. So providing a visual aid that gives an idea of your technology uh, directly after the first paragraph is extremely useful. Um, again, we have to digest information very quickly because just the sheer volume of applications that we have. So. Uh, it doesn't have to be a super pretty, pretty picture, it, but it does need to be illustrative of what's happening in your technology. Oh, it, 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 a visual aid to help us digest the concept of what you're proposing. So that's the second thing. The third thing um, is in a, any new technology, you should back up your, your claims with some preliminary data and if you don't have preliminary data, there, there should definitely be very strong scientific rationalization for why you think the technology sh should work. So in this case, we put some preliminary charge discharge cycles with a fluorine, uh, rechargeable fluorine ion battery. And so this, we often get uh, stuff with pretty, pretty, um, pretty big claims, but there's, but there's no nothing to back it up. Um, so claims are okay uh, if either you have data or you you go through scientifically why uh, what you're proposing is possible. Uh, it, this is this is pretty critical. So this is after we understand the idea. This is the next thing that we really look for is what is what is the justification for that idea? Okay. Or. Um, we generally do have a good idea where the state of the art is. However, uh, it is important to compare yourself 
to the state of the art um, uh, right up front. Uh, in this case, uh, we, uh, the example given, the solid state uh, fluorine ion batteries uh, have a theoretical energy density of 792 watt hours per kilogram, uh, which compares favorably to lithium ion batteries at 568 watt hours per kilogram. So here we've kind of shown right away that from a theoretical standpoint, this battery is promising. And, and this is basically what we're looking for. Um, we, one might argue that your uh, technology is so uh, radical that there's nothing to compare it to. Um, for example, you develop the first cell phone and there's only landlines. Um, in this case, you should compare it to landlines. Uh, this actually does help your proposal in demonstrating how radical it is. Uh, so th there always is some state of the art that can that there is that you should compare to to give us an idea of where the impact is. Okay, last um, but not least, um, uh, after you've set up what the techn technological innovation is and um, you've said why it's, you think it's possible or given some data, the, the next question that's always on our mind is why hasn't someone done this before? And uh, so the next, the last sort of thing we really like to see is a clear identification of what the technical challenges are, why is this program risky, that is, and what's going to be your approach to solving them? Why, why, why is it that you are going to be able to solve this problem and no one else has? So we've given an example here, you know, several key challenges remain to demonstrating a viable uh, fluorine ion battery, including XYZ, and then these are our approaches to solving those problems. So this, this is the, the last thing in terms of if you've hit these sort of five high-level items, um, I think you will have gone a long ways to putting yourself uh, forward as a winning, winning proposal. So just to sort of summarize, um, in, in applying uh, or preparing your technical pitch, um, these are sort of the five things uh, best practices. One, get get to the point quickly of what the technological innovation is. Two, uh, provide a visual aid that helps us in digesting what that innovation is. Three, back up your data or give a strong rational, uh, a ra strong rational and scientific rationalization why you think this is possible. Say four, say where you are relative to the state of the art and last, um, identify the technical challenges. So um, this is pr this advice is pretty focused on concept paper phase. A lot of these elements uh, do translate to the full application phase. Um, I think it's important for you to uh, take a look at um, what we call the, the Heilemeyer Catechism. Uh, when just after you complete your application, going through this list of questions. Um, George Heilemar was the DARPA director from 1975 to 1977. Uh, he helped develop uh, uh, digital displays. Uh, and he came up with this list of questions for, for DARPA directors uh, when they first started. And every uh, RPE director gets a copy of these questions when they start. And these are the questions that we ask ourselves about our programs. And we also ask these about every individual project. So when you go through um, your application, I, I would recommend that uh, you take a look at these questions and ask if you've answered them very um, completely. And, and they're pretty straightforward. Um, you know, what is it you're trying to do? And articulate it um, with no jargon. Um, how is it done today? Uh, what's new about your approach? Um, often the most difficult one. Who cares? Why should we care about, about what you're doing? Um, and if you're successful, what's the impact that it will make? How much will it cost? How long is it going to take? Um, you know, what, you know, we don't fund typically projects more than uh, one time. So at the end of us uh, uh, funding your project, uh, where will you be? 
So what are the exams that let us know that you've been successful? So these are really critical, and if you can go through uh, these questions and, and feel like you answered them completely within the context of the RPE mission, I think you'll be uh, on your way to having a, a winning application to RPE. And that's it. I think we'll now move to, to questions. Great. Thank you very much, Dane and Elon. And uh, again, today is a re-recording, and we're using the questions that were submitted uh, during our live broadcast. And to start, I wanted to go back to the issue of teams. And Ilan, you talked about the kind of challenge if you've got superstars that don't seem that they've coordinated. Several of our questions asked, you know, what are the chances if you have, uh, if your company has a very short history, um, or maybe you're a less experienced investigator, your assistant professor, you know, how important is experience uh, in putting the team together and in how you guys look at those projects? Uh, so this is Elon. I mean, I, I, think it's a, I think it's a good question. I, I'd start by saying, you know, generally speaking, we talk about wanting to fund the best ideas, sort of regardless of where they come from. And so if you look at where RPE projects get funded, you know, some are in academia, some are in national labs, nonprofits, uh, traditional small businesses, large company research groups. Um, and so, you know, we generally don't try not to have any biases really coming in to, to what type of experience you need to have. Um, I think the two things that we look at really strongly, one that I mentioned is if we line up all of the technical risks of a project, does the team have the capabilities and expertise to address all of the different types of risks. So if your project has a, a chemical, a chemistry component and an electrical, elect, uh, electrical engineering component, do you have a strong chemist and a strong electrical engineer? Um, you know, in terms of experience, uh, I think, you know, we definitely need to see, right, some, you know, some expertise and some capabilities. I don't think you can answer that uh, across the, the bat. Experience obviously helps <laughs> in demonstrating capabilities of expertise, but I don't think it's, you know, having, right, someone on your team that has 50 years of experience uh, and is just sort of, you know, the, the guru in the field. You know, that's, that's in no way uh, a necessary component of a, of a winning proposal. And oftentimes some of the best new innovative ideas and some of the sort of hungriest, most aggressive PIs are younger folks with, with less experience. I don't know, Dane might have some other thoughts. I, I completely agree with Elon. I mean, we get a lot of, of proposals to say, or I've read a lot to say, you know, we're the experts in this field. Um, fund us. <laughs> uh, so those don't hold a lot of water at RPE. Um, if you're an expert, you better show it through the quality of your application, not through saying that you're the expert. Uh, that that just holds no water here, um, and I think I completely agree with Elon. Some of the more innovative proposals come from the people that I would say a little on the less experienced side. Um, that doesn't mean that ultimately, uh, when you start to build out your team, you shouldn't start to build out some of the expertise uh, that you're going to need to be successful. Um, but uh, absolutely, uh, it's about the idea. Yeah. I'll just add one last thing. I mean, you know, when we think about, right, we talked about the big things that RPE is looking for. You'll notice, you know, potential impact was huge, novelty was huge, um, right, disruptive. But we obviously care about will it succeed, but it's actually lower on the list, right? And so the question of, you know, yeah. trying to hit a home run is actually more important than, you know, do you have the 50 years of experience that will know you're going to accomplish it successfully? Right. One might argue, with all your 50 years of experience, you haven't done it yet. Uh, that it might, this, might, this, this might be a disadvantage. A uh, follow-up on the teaming is, some folks have asked, you know, does RBE prefer to see industrial applicants rather than academic ones, or are there specific requirements and combinations of industry and university? You might want to comment on if there are preferences or if that's kind of agnostic. I would say completely agnostic. We, 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 you know, Alon, I think, hits the nail on the head. We find ideas. We don't care where they come from. Yeah. I think one of the, one of the maybe misconceptions, I think people, uh, sometimes people come to us and say, well, we know we need to be teaming 
you know, with industry, we know that we need to be teaming with other, we need multidisciplinary projects to succeed at RPE. And actually, I, I think there might be correlation there, but not causation in the sense that, you know, a lot of the teams we do fund have a multidisciplinary component, have industry working with academia, um, but oftentimes that's because a lot of the really novel, interesting ideas come from, you know, different fields interacting, come from people from other fields actually uh, addressing a problem in a new way. So, um, you know, basically agreeing agreeing with Dane here. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's move into some questions asking about the types of research that, that RPE likes to see. One is um, about basic research. You know, is, if someone is planning to conduct research that's starting with, that, with basic materials research that may lead to eventual application, is that in the RPE wheelhouse? I would say if you can draw the correlation to the application, y yes. Um, research for research sake is not what we do. We do translational research to technology. So um, if it's a super duper electrolyte that's going to enable fast charging of batteries, that's, in our, that's definitely uh, of interest. And if it's still pretty early but there's good foundation uh, for, for the technology, uh, I think we'd be interested. And uh, the other thing is to realize that we have two types of funding mechanisms. We do a seed funding, which is typically under a million, and then we do a full fund which funding, which is uh, anywhere between you know uh, two and seven million. Yeah. So I mean, in, in that case, right? I mean, a, a seed is normally something where there isn't a lot of data existing. There's just some ideas, and we're really funding a proof of concept, uh, which looks a little bit more like you know, the, the really more closer to fundamental research, but obviously very much application oriented. Um, the bigger projects were really looking for the, you know, the first real demonstration that what we thought could, right, what, what you thought you could accomplish with this technology is actually possible. Normally that's like a lab scale demonstration. Um, uh, and so, you know, either of those is okay, right? RPE kind of sits within the Department of Energy. We have we have the Office of Science, which is doing really fundamental science. Uh, we've got, you know, the applied programs like EERE, which are really funding, you know, larger scale demonstrations, et cetera. Uh, we can play anywhere in between. And I think Dane's initial comment is probably the most important one, which is as long as you can draw a connection between the research and development you're doing and a potential impact in one of our mission areas, you're in good shape. Great. I think Dane mentioned in, in, during the presentation about how um, long we fund. We typically fund something once. And some, uh, we have a question here saying, for truly innovative technologies that might meet or exceed RPE's mission goals, but will require a considerable amount of research to prove viability of the basic concepts, behind that technology. Is that something, how would RPE think about something that was proposed that kind of is upfront acknowledging that there's a lot of research needed here to, to get there, even if the potential impact is, is big, it's significant, and it's in the mission area? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a good question. I mean, you know, generally speaking, I think we think about this a lot when we construct the programs, right? We're trying to put out a problem statement where we think that we can, you know, the proposals we get in will be such that we can fund, you know, great world-class teams for two to three years on the order of, you know, at most we're, you know, we'll be putting in, you know, five, six million dollars. And, you know, we're going to try and construct a problem statement such that we feel like by funding that we're going to actually move the needle in whether this is a feasible solution or not um, and move it towards impact. And so, Normally, you know, that's the sweet spot right now. I don't know if Dan has any other thoughts on it. I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess the way I look at it is, is, is our function as an agency is de-risking. And so if the technology concept has a 20% chance of success and RPE can take it to an 80, but there's still 90% of the work left in terms of funding, um, we will have done our job. Our, you know, our job is not to, to fund the technology all the way to a product. Um, our job is to de-risk it and show whether or not it's possible. Um, if we've done that successfully, uh, we have accomplished what our sort of our goal is. Um, 
So we, you know, we don't fund long term. Uh, what we will do, though, is work with programs if they show a lot of potential and they can de-risk some of the key scientific challenges. Uh, work with some of the other agencies, whether it's in DOD, Department of Defense, or other agencies within Department of Energy to get them follow-on funding to take it to the next stage. Kind of following up on the idea of incremental versus transformative. One question uh, was Elon referring to your example slides up at the beginning. You know, the the more you know fun examples of 10x you know coffee filtration. You know, kind of, but there the person's asking. You know, that's great. You know, if this if an efficiency improvement is 10x, if that's an example. But what about how do we think about incremental versus transformative? If a technology improves heat transfer efficiency by 3x. Is that incremental or transformative? And maybe you could just kind of talk about how would we, you know, more define what we mean by transformational and is it, is it just, you know, it's not the DeLorean. You know, there's gradations back from the DeLorean where we see transformational. Yeah, I, I mean, I, my answer would be pretty simple in the sense of, you know, we've got three mission areas we're looking for technologies where if they're successful, they can move the needle, you know, significant advances in one of those. And I use the example of, you know, we, we think in terms of quads here, <laughs> right? So, you know, if you want to know kind of what's significant, it's quads or quads equivalent uh, of, of whatever you're talking about. Um, you know, the example that you gave, Adam, of just heat transfer generally, you know, I think raises the question of, well, what if it's a platform technology and the connection is not just, okay, for this specific application, I, right? I've developed a better solar panel, and so now we have better, you know, solar power generation. Um, you know, heat transfer could have impacts across a lot of different applications, and that's okay. Uh, and those could be very big opportunities for impact. Normally, when we set up a program description and solicitation, we'll try and point out the different application areas that we think are relevant and, and where the impact is going to come from. But as an applicant, you should, you should draw that connection yourselves. And as long as you feel like there's a credible story drawing the connection between your advance and making those big impacts, that's great. I, I don't think there's any issue there. And just to underscore for our listeners, I think Elon said, read the FOA. You know, read, <laughs> a lot of effort goes into that, and I think a lot of the questions that we received during the live broadcast were about how can we understand what RPE is looking for, how can we understand, you know, what the goal is and what the metrics are, and, and RPE puts a lot of effort into crafting the funding opportunity announcements to give that guidance very clearly. Yeah. I mean, Dane, Dane talked about all the different all the different internal reviews we go through for project selection, I and mean, we also go through a bunch of rounds of reviews for what the program description looks like. So a lot of thought has gone into every line in those program descriptions. Right. Do market projections play a role in either the development of FOAs or in your review and evaluation of proposals? Uh, yeah. I, that's, I, that's actually, I think it's phrased in, in a tough way. Um, uh, So, so my take on this, you know, is we we very consciously have decided that we want to make an impact. Um, we want there to be a credible path from the technology demonstration to some impact. As an applicant, we don't expect you to have knowledge uh, about you know the nitty gritty of a commercial space um, or or commercial acumen. Uh, and so we're we're going to take our knowledge base, our thinking about the program, look at your technology, and um, and if we believe there's potential for that impact, that's good enough. Uh, I, I don't I don't think people should should feel as though they need to have some you know business plan in the back of their head when they propose. They may have some. some no, I agree with that. that. And you know, it's technology first. The impact, obviously, at a high level, has to be there, but. Um, you know, we, we don't expect, you know, market projections to be a critical part of an application. Yeah, I mean, may, maybe an example there is, you know, we've got a program on, um, you know, we, we see our role as, as kind of developing technology options. Right. Right. And uh, towards our mission areas, right, at RPE, we can't control things like policy, things like markets. So we want to keep, we try and keep them in mind. 
um, but they're, they're not necessarily hard filters on, on what we're doing. Great. I, on, the, on the spirit of options, um, one uh, question comes in and says, you know, the most recent open FOA had over 50 subtopics. How do you manage deciding impact in one subtopic being more important than another, you know, and weighing through all of those? And not, you know, just for everyone listening, we can't comment specifically on open FOA, but just at a process level, strategically, how do you go about balancing choosing between those 50 subgroups? Well, I mean, I, right. Generally speaking, it's not you know we're not comparing these proposals to one another in most cases, right? We're, and specifically in our review process, we're reviewing each proposal on the merits uh, and thinking about you know how does that align with what we're looking for. Uh, and so there might be 57 subgroups. You know, it's not like we need to fund. You know, it's not Noah's Ark here. We don't need to fund two in each subgroup. Um, and so, right. I mean, I, I'd say. You know, I'd say it's pretty easy <laughs> to distinguish because we're just looking at each one, each one and saying, is, is this RPE or not? Is that yeah, I agree. I mean, we look for impact, um, you know, certainly within the field, but also more broadly. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, w I would say it just depends uh, on the quality of the proposal and the quality of the technical idea. Uh, you know, it could be if it were really transformative in biofuels. For example, um, and advance that field. Uh, biofuels we, we recognize as being potentially impactful on RP emission areas. Um, would it be as big of an improvement as uh, I don't know, a 10 percent increase in solar panel efficiency? It's hard to say because it's an emerging field. So we generally just take the approach, as as Elon said, of of not picking sort of technological approaches, but but creating technological options. Yeah. I mean, w one thing to keep in mind is when you when you read our solicitations, we normally have the review criteria that the reviewers are using and that we're using to assess project proposals. And then there's something there that talks about basically, you know, program policy factors, uh, one of which often to be, ha usually ends up being sort of a balance of, of different approaches or different ideas. And I think that the important point there is we do think about sort of balancing things in portfolios in the sense of, you know, um, right, if we look at something in a very conventional area, you know, something that we know the, the industry is already focused on, we might look at those proposals slightly differently than if we have a proposal where we said, wow, we didn't even know that problem existed, right? And so, you know, this proposal has something about it that's really special and different, and, and that might make it stand out or be unique. Great. Well, thank you both very much uh, for today's presentation, and uh, I know we have a lot of other questions uh, that we can't get to today, but continue to tune in for future editions of RPE University. Uh, we'll continue to find ways to, to bring you webinars on topics that can help you in your own work. RPE has limited funds. We do attempt to fund uh, the best technologies, but we know there are more ideas than there are dollars. And so this is our effort here is to help give some support and encouragement to everyone. But we can't give you money, but we can hope to give you uh, guidance in making your technology successful. So that's all from RPE. Until next time.